Welcome to the Europeans. My name is Rob Hornstra, I'm a photographer. And next to me is writer Arnold van Brugge. We are documenting Europe in a decade where Europe is sliding deeper and deeper into crisis. War made its return. Authoritarian regimes are on the rise and revive ghosts from the past. The climate crisis predicts an apocalyptic future and, along with the pandemic, drives communities apart into like-minded bubbles. The political dream of a united and peaceful Europe seems to be falling apart. Between 2020 and 2030, Arnold and I will travel every six months to a region in Europe where we create portraits of Europeans in words and pictures. <clears throat> in an ideal scenario, we would document 20 regions in 10 years' time. This methodology makes our project a bit like a European road trip. In each region, we focus on the local identity, but at the same time, we work on overarching themes that are common to all regions. Here, for example, you can see us working in an abattoir in the Basque country, which fits into our ambition to focus on the food industry in all places in Europe. Such a visit can then lead to a portrait of the manager, you see here, with a discussion about changing attitudes towards meat in our Western society. This presentation is structured as follows. First, I will show you some examples from history, projects that inspire us and that illustrate the great and overarching ambition of, the, of our project. Our ambition is still to be seen in a hundred years' times in an illuminating document about Europe in the, in the 2020s. <clears throat> After this, Arnold will elaborate on the content and the relevance of our project, the Europeans, among other things on the basis of our previous multi-year project in Russia. After which I will talk about our working methods, the publications and exhibitions we make and the ways in which we try to engage to the public. After all, it is not only our ambition to still be relevant in a hundred years' time, we also want to make an impact during the project by offering a counterweight to the increasing polarization in Europe. So first, we go back hundred years in time. <clears throat> Do you know this book, Face of Our Time, by August Sander? In 1911, Sander started his project People of the 20th Century, which he worked on for decades. He wanted to depict a human image of his time and portrait people who fell within self-chosen categories, something we also do in the Europeans. The farmer, the skilled tradesman, the women, classes and professions, the artist, etc. The work was in the form of a selection of 60 portraits for the first time published in a book in 1929, entitled Anlied der Zeit. Seven years later, the book was confiscated by the Nazis and the original photographic plates destroyed. It was to no avail. Sanders' work is still considered a seminal work, has been republished endless, endlessly, and is still regularly exhibited worldwide. From Europe, we move to America. Are you familiar with the Farm Security Administration? The Farm Security Administration was a government-funded organization established in 1937 to combat rural poverty during the Great Depression in the United States. The FSA was best known for their influential photography program between 1935 and 1944. Something we now look back on with a healthy dose of jealousy in 2022. Photographers and writers were hired to report on the plight of poor farmers. Nothing like nowadays, where governments only hire photographers and writers to make Next, do you know this book? One of the photographers who worked for the Farm Security Administration was Walker Evans. At the same time that he was working for the FSA, Evans was working with writer James Etchie 
on an assignment for Fortune magazine on the conditions among sharecropper families in the, in the American South during the Great Depression. Let us now praise famous man, first published in 1941, sold only half of its press run following publication, but since then has won high praise over the years and is routinely studied as a source of both journalistic and literary, uh, literary innovation. It's an inspiring example to us that real quality reporting should not be guided too much by sales numbers or by popular contemporary visual culture. And this one, do you know this book? In 1947, just after Second World War, writer John Steinbeck and photographer Robert Kappa wanted to travel through the Soviet Union, a country depicted in American media as dangerous and barbaric. The story goes that no one was interested in funding their plans. Until finally, after a few drinks in a bar, they managed to persuade the editor-in-chief of the New York Herald to reluctantly agree. Steinbeck and Kappa portray Soviet people as living in different, con different conditions as being portrayed systematically in Western media. Their text and photographic record of life under Stav Joseph Stalin's rule, published in 1948, is now seen as an important historical document. And another one. In 1955, the Swiss photographer Robert Frank secured a Guggenheim Fellowship in America, a big grant, allowing him to make several road trips across America for two years and photograph all strata of its society. Within photography, the Americans is seen as a starting point of the road trip phenomenon, in which Frank's goal was to photograph America as it unfolded before his somewhat bleak outsider's eye. This is where the American meets our project, the Europeans, as well. At first, Robert Frank could not even find an American publisher. So the book was first published in 1958 in France as Le Américain. A year later, the book finally made it to America with an introduction by Jack Kerouac, Kerouac can pronounce it, as the selling strategy. Initially, the book received harsh criticism. Meaningless blur, grain, muddy exposures, drunken horizons, and general sloppiness. Over time, and through its inspiration of later artists, the Americans became considered a seminal work in American photography and art history. And this one, the last one, cannot be missed, of course. Les Européens by Henri Cartier-Bresson only because of the name and the introductory text, from which I quote here, Cartier-Bresson traveled over a period of five years across Europe in order to capture what it means to be European. Beyond nationalism and the particular characteristics of each culture and nation, he found evidence of a greater identity. Beautiful. I must honestly admit that it is Cartier-Bresson's title and description that really appeal to us. As a photographer, I think Cartier-Bresson is severely overrated, personal opinion. What was interesting for us to discover during our research is that few photographers since Cartier-Bresson have attempted to define Europe. Of course, there are photographers who focus on a specific pan-European topic. The European refugee crisis is perhaps the most obvious example, or European borders, European intersections, football fields, or the center of Europe. Perhaps Paul Graham's book, New Europe, published in 1993, comes closest to our ambitions, but a culture of large-scale projects, European road trips with the ambition of defining Europe in a specific period of time, as the Americans have continued to do on many occasions, is lacking in European photography. With the Europeans, we want to revive this tradition. There are many other projects that inspire us or have similarities with our way of working. I could name a whole battalion of American photographers who have made great books and exhibitions in the tra tradition of the American road trip after the turn of the century. Alex Soth is perhaps the best example. 
We would love to come back and fill another hour with all the contemporary American photographers who are interpreting America in brilliant ways. But time forces us to move on, and we do so by focusing on our own way of working and going deeper into the substantive motivation of the Europeans. So, before I hand over the torch to Arnold, let me briefly introduce our previous project, the Sochi Project. Between 2009 and 2014, we worked in the region around Olympic Sochi in Russia. We expected Russia to use the games to make propaganda, and we thought it would be a good idea to create alternative stories. In five years' time, we made 10 books and exhibitions. Varying from the tourist industry around subtropical Sochi, the isolation of the neighboring country of Abkhazia, and the brutal human rights violations straight from Sochi across the mountains into the North Caucasus. Obviously, the latter led to us being banned from Russia until today. The project ended with a 400-page book an atlas of war and tourism in the Caucasus, numerous exhibitions and in and outside Europe, and a website in Dutch, English and Russian. Thanks to the predictable decision by the Russians to declare the regions around the Olympic stadiums to forbid an area six months before the game started, our work was published in leading media all over the world. There was hardly any other work available. And I end where Arnold begins, the short introduction video for the Sochi project. could not be where it is today without support, vision and passion of one man, President Vladimir Putin. Mr. President, members of the International Olympic Committee, Sochi is a unique place. On the seashore, you can enjoy a fine spring day, but up in the mountains, it's winter. We are allocating around some of $12 billion for this. Mesdames et Messieurs, soutenez, s'il vous plaît, le rêve olympique de millions de Russes. is going to feel at home in Sochi. Thank you. So in the, in the six years traveling and working in the Russian Federation, in Russian Caucasus and Southern Caucasus, we learned to know this country as uh, one of the ru famous metaphors goes about Russia, a Potemkin village. And for those who don't know, these were the, the fake villages built by Potemkin, General Potemkin, to boast of his gr great works uh, in Crimea, to Tsar Katrina the Great. And I understood today they've tried to, to build the same kind of things in Mariupol for the uh, victory day. Um, and this is Sochi, it's also like a modern Potemkin village. This is Krasnaya Polyana. It's a very small alpine village in the, very close to Sochi. It was the main stage for the Winter Games in the, in the Olympic Games of 2014. The Olympic Winter Games held in the subtropical seaside resort. The stadium's being built on marshland, protected marshlands, and the road from the mountains to the marshlands was so expensive, you could have paved it with 1.1 centimeters of black caviar. They, uh, they calculated that Russian journalist, or 14 centimeters of fine cognac. 
the entire 28 kilometers. The building operations were so corrupt, even Putin, who gained power and wealth through corruption in the Leningrad Harbor in the 1990s and built modern Russia on the whole idea of corruption and clientelism, had to interfere. The games enriched Putin's judo instructor and Medvedev's ski instructor with 2 billion euros combined. In the meanwhile, of course, local activists like the people uh, portrayed here were being evicted from their houses and harassed. The insane amount of money spent in Sochi went to an area of a few square kilometers, right at the coast at the foot of the Caucasus Mountains. And the games were a big success. Attending sporters enjoyed themselves, fans were enthusiasts, and one of Putin's servants called it, this is the new face of Russia. Our Russia, also with this nationalist connotation, of course. Nashi Rasia. We saw the games being built. It was actually one of the most boring parts of the storytelling we did there over the six years we spent in Russia. The real Potemkin story we saw was the Russia across the borders, in Abkhazia and Georgia, or the Russia we saw in the Northern Caucasus, in republics with infamous names like Dagestan and Chechnya. Here we saw real Russia, Europe's last empire. This is actually when you move from Russia to Georgia, you, you witness this huge monument. It's the Russian-Georgian Friendship Monument, which was uh, at a bitter context after the war in 2008 between Russia and Georgia. But Russia is an empire, em empire that, like Great Britain, the Netherlands and France, went through some pain while dissolving or decolonizing. These were the 1990s of Russia when the Soviet Union dissolved. It was the birthplace of all disaster, Putin repeatedly says. But Russia is still an empire within its vast territory. It has numerous more or less autonomous republics it controls in a mostly violent or suppressive way. It holds huge control over Belarus, eastern Ukraine, Crimea, and conflicts abroad, such as Karabakh or the different regions in Central Asia. This is the Russia we met. This is the Russia of Hamzat, who worked as a police officer in Russia when he was attacked by separatists. He tried to save his checkpoint, but his colleagues fled. Now he's handicapped for life, and he listens to Russian opposition radio all day. Echo Moskvi doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, since the war. And I wonder how he's doing now, because he predicted us one day there will be peace in 2012. The Russia we met is the Russia of Gava, who was, when we met her, still looking for her husband, who disappeared after routine control by local police forces. And his body has never been found, so after five years, the judge announced him to be dead, like with so many other young and older men in this region. It's the Russia of Said Ahmed, who lost two sons and many nephews to the security services who thought his family and Islamic beliefs posed a huge risk to local national authorities. A few months after our, a few months after our meeting, also Said Ahmed, he was the last male surviving member of his family, was shot and killed as well. These are Ketevan and Anna, both born refugees, who have lived all their young lives in a big refugee flat in Georgia. They know the stories of their homeland, but during the project, they slowly lost, lost hope of even ever visiting the place they come from, Abkhazia. And we met them two in these pictures four years apart, but actually nothing changed in their life except for the wallpaper, as you can see. And they're not really sole examples, they're really re representatives of so many people we met, because that's our way of working. Meet as much people as you can, interview them about their private lives, their family histories, and slowly, slowly you get a personal history of a region, of a country. Um, people, um, people used to live with different and violent security services, refugees that are used to dream about their country in the past, soldiers that extend Russia's border every day, meter by meter, in South Ossetia. And that all led to our books and exhibitions from 2009 onwards. Like Rob already told us, the, the project had a huge impact. More than 400,000 people visited our website in the first months as a sort of database for facts about this region in the run-up to the Games. And many journalists who couldn't enter this region they tried to contact us and actually sort of copied our stories uh, for their own media, which was very 
good for us because the story got told to a much bigger audience. So we traveled around the world with our project from New Delhi to Toronto and many cities in between. And after that, we thought, what to do now? It was a huge black space, of course. Rob went teaching in Den Haag in the Art Academy, and I went back to making documentaries, TV documentaries. And we started thinking about a new project, what to do. Um, many regions crossed our minds, many, many themes. There's so much relevance, relevant projects to think of these days. But we ended up with Europe, and not the EU, but really just Europe, as broad as you want it. So we can imagine that one day the project will take us to former colonies, for instance, or other spheres that are influenced by Europe in, a, in one way or another. Like Rob already told us, we think it will be a decisive decade for Europe. The effects of Brexit are yet to be seen. The rise of populism, right-wing extremism, in liberal countries is ongoing. And I think don't let the unity of this war in Europe, the unity of Europe in this war, uh, distract you. Because what's happening in Poland is continuing, of course, the, the uh, dissolving of the, of the, uh, the Rechtsstaat, how do you say that? Judicial system, I don't know. Yeah. So we decided to document these 20 regions in 10 years' time. Um, and we started the project when the pandemic hit us, and we continued the project when the war started. So I think we've already been through quite a lot this decade, right? It's, uh, it's already enough for this decade almost, but we're afraid there's much more to come. Uh, how do you document a continent? That's quite, uh, it's quite big. Uh, the Russian Caucasus was much more small and much easier to, to document for us. Uh, how do you document the continent? We decided to work the same way as during the Sochi project, so what I just told. We're not going after politicians, we're not going after great thinkers, policy makers. We build up a timepiece after visiting countless of Europeans living everywhere, documenting their life histories and their expectations. For instance, meet Castutis. Castutis has Nara, has, has <clears throat> Castutis has not Nazi paraphernalia at his man cave walls. We're here in his man cave next to his house. In his family history, Nazis were better than the Soviet soldiers who came later. As he described it, it, he had to jump from a wolf to a bear. That's how he says it. His shed at home is a shrine to independence. Dozens of photos recall his family and all the times they had to fight for independence. And in pursuit of that goal, Castuda says, choices sometimes had to be made that in retrospect were questionable. History isn't black or white, he says. Castudis her heroes are now in Lithuania being pulled from their pedestals and plagues removed from walls. And he sees it as an attempt to criminalize his grandfather's guerrilla war. And now he walks in nationalist marches with the kind of flags that make you shiver. Meet European Pius. He's 23, and he lives in the same city as Castutis, which we just saw. And a few years ago, Pius logged into Facebook in the middle of the night, wrote a short message, and publicly, publicly posted the photo he had just taken of him kissing his boyfriend. He was happy after a long night in town. But the next morning, Pius woke up and saw his photo had gone viral, but viral in the worst way possible. It had attracted thousands of comments, many of which stated that Pius should be burned, gassed, or killed in some other horrific manner. Same-sex relationships are forbidden in this country, Lithuania. There are no gay bars, no pride events. The police and courts at all levels, all the way up to the Supreme Court in Vilnius, blamed Pius himself for provoking these comments. Only after five years, the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg ruled that after Pius posted the photo, the regime had failed to adequately investigate incitement to hatred and violence against LGTB people. Almost every European can go to this highest court to get justice. Meet these European butchers, also in Lithuania. In 20 years' time, they expect to butcher insects. They prepare for a changing world. It was quite a surprise to us. Meet Augustine. 
While the local natives in the town where she lives don't believe in their city centers, which are devastated by shopping malls in the suburbs and ruining policies by conservative governments, new migrants like Augustine from Cameroon are pouring in and starting new businesses, having big dreams. And they're really transforming the city centers of these post-industrial wastelands like the black country where Augustine lives, Dudley, next to Birmingham, and where Augustine is planning her giant party center right in the middle of town. One last example, Benyat Etchibest. He lives in uh, Le Pays Basque in France, and he doesn't believe his state serves him anymore. He decided to start his own cooperative, co cooperative with a big group of disillusioned youngsters to try and extract himself and his collective from this capitalist world. Meet a war monument. This is one in Abkhazia. In almost every village and city in Europe, we meet war monuments, sometimes with flowers like here, sometimes desecrated with slogans or graffiti. This is Europe, made by wars and conflicts, full of identities based on the other, on conflicts won and lost, on border-defining events. Right at the time when the last witnesses of our great last war, the Second World War, are dying and memories are fading, a new interstate war between Russia and Ukraine is rumbling our continent and creates fresh European identities based on, we don't want this. My eight-year-old son, he follows the news on a daily basis and now knows it as well. Like President Zelensky said, never again has a new meaning now, refreshed for everybody. It got Rob and, Rob and me thinking uh, when we went back uh, from the Pay Bus to Netherlands last time. When we made the Sochi project, we tried to describe all these horrors we met, all these personal stories, these accounts of human rights violations, all the workings of a repressive state. And we called these winter games, like I told you before, the, the giant Potemkin project. But we got a lot of criticism from that, from fellow journalists, from Russians, and of course from the Russian propagandists. And in hindsight, we noticed that we took it a little bit too serious, because we constantly tried to walk the tightrope and use what you call today false balance, to not be constantly called Russophobe or negative about Russia whatsoever. Uh, you don't know the stability and progress Putin brought to Russia. You know that kind of arguments. And we try to input that false balance in our stories as well. But it didn't really help because in the end, we made it to the official website called Russophobe. It's a French website where all the Russophobes worldwide are being mentioned. We were expelled from Russia. Even trying to keep this false balance wasn't enough to make it a positive story, of course, for many critics. So now we look back and think, shit, we should have been much more proactive that day. We should have warned the world a little more because, I mean, every little bit helps a bit. So that's a bit the background on how we want to proceed with the Europeans project the coming decade, to follow our intuition a bit more about what's happening in Europe, and also to be, it's a dirty word in journalist terms, uh, as activist as our journalist works allows us to. So, well, please, we invite you to follow us in the coming years on our social media and website, and maybe for a talk afterwards. Now I give the floor to Rob. So now you know more or less what our inspirations are. And also, uh, yeah, what, what we actually um, want to work on, what the topics are in the Europeans. And what I'm going to try to sketch out now is what we are actually doing in these 10 years by dividing uh, this project into 20 regions, hopefully. As indicated, we are working from region to region in Europe. By 2020, we have completed our first region. We titled this region the former capital. After that, we worked in regions with thematic titles such as the Black Country, the Naval Base, and our ancestral home. In our presentations, we never reveal the name of the place where the work was made. With presentations, I mean books, exhibitions, etc. It's not secret in a talk like this. To illustrate our working method in different regions, in this presentation, I will make use of our most recent chapter, the Naval Base. 
We completed this at the end of last year with the launch of a final publication and an exhibition at the location where the work was made. As indicated earlier, in each region we focus on the local identity, but at the same time we work on overarching themes that are common to all regions. In the naval base, of course, that story was about the Navy, its, its dependence on the government and the consequences of this dependence for the town. Although this is a red thread that runs through the publication, we spread out much further over the city. The themes that fit within the larger picture of the Europeans. Leisure, for example, is something we deal with in all regions. In the naval base, this led to a photo series about the former Ritz club and association life, hobby club association life. There's not a good English translation for this. Another example is the local fishing industry, which of course fits seamlessly into our overarching theme of food industry. In this way, clusters of some stories from different regions slowly merge and fit in together. Back to the presentation of, a regional, of this regional chapter. From the start of the Europeans, Arnold and I decided that the work we do in a region will first be presented in that region. We make hundreds of portraits per region and work together with local communities and local networks. We feel indebted to them for being the first to view and comment on the work. We are always looking for that confrontation. We get great feedback, ranging from retired Navy officers who think we should remove the local brothel from the exhibition, to discussions about the Syrian refugee Kamal, who works at the fish auction, and according to some, does not belong in the naval base. Speaking of that Syrian refugee, at the opening of the exhibition, we presented the first copy of our publication to him and to his employer, Bert. Bert gave a wonderful speech about Kamal, who himself was a fisherman in Syria, and Kamal's importance to the fish auction nowadays, where it's difficult to find new workers. What we are doing in the run-up to the exhibition is also cooperating with the local newspaper. Here you see examples from the first chapter and the naval base, which is the third. We offer to deliver a weekly portrait with a short text. We do not ask for a fee for the work, but we do want mention of our upcoming exhibition or presentation. In this way, we read tens of thousands of people in the region where we work, resulting in a relatively large audience during exhibitions. And if possible, if the budget allows us, we even print posters and distribute them all over town. We also recreate every regional presentation on online exhibition platform ArtSteps. There you can walk around 24-7 in 3D virtual reality and look at the photos and story. Um, here it's translated into in peace, but that's not exactly what I mean. At any time. Not just for locals, but also for anyone who lives further away from the region where we worked and present. The idea arose after our first exhibition was postponed by Corona. To our surprise, that exhibition online has been viewed more than 25,000 times since then. We then decided to recreate all future regional exhibitions online, with the ambition of starting an online museum where all the different regional exhibitions can be visited. The 112-page booklet that we make of, of and in all regions uh, are being sold for 9 euro 50. Arnold and I are both big fans of beautiful photo books, beautiful books in general, but at the same time we know that those books only reach a very limited audience because of their price. We want locals to visit our regional presentations but also have the possibility to buy our book and they won't do that if they see an expensive photo book. Hence the price of 9 euro 50, 
which is slightly be below production cost. This is made possible by a wonderful group of private sponsors who adopt the region for 120 euros before the publication. And in return, they receive a numbered hardcover edition of the same publication afterwards. That's on the left side in this slide. So last weekend, we started the subscription process for our next chapter, our ancestral home, which will be presented locally on 13 July of this year. Please help us to keep this chapter accessible for a broad audience through affordable publication. At the end of this presentation, there will be a QR code with which you can adopt this region for 120 euros if you want. Meanwhile, we are also experimenting further outside regional exhibitions with formats for a pan-European approach, where we let go of the regions and mix Europeans from different regions. For example, in this poster campaign, uh, which was where we distributed hundreds of posters uh, to people or shops, and they could stick it behind their windows, turning the outdoor space in town into an exhibition space for the Europeans. Passersby could read background stories by scanning the QR code in the poster. And in the future, we also want to have all these background stories and all these portraits coming together in an online large database. And the posters on the streets referring to this website and the stories on the website and bringing people further into this website. A kind of jukebox full of Europeans and their views, ideas and, ide uh, ideas and ideals. Um, and here it stops. And that's because I didn't have time to continue. But it's also almost finished. Almost everything is in there. The website is something we are very much aiming for to produce in the upcoming period. We want to have it finished already, but the budget is monstrous, gigantic. And we're trying to find sponsors for the website as well. It's always a huge struggle to do projects, 10-year projects like this, and presenting the projects in every half year at a super fast pace is a way to get attention for your project and also to find funding from different sites. So that's the way we do it. Um, for now, I'm a kind of finished. Uh, do you have something to add? No, maybe there are questions or maybe there are questions. Or, uh, we're still very much searching for a way to um, how to do this project or what themes to cover or what regions to come. So we're also very much open to suggestions or other things. I don't know if there are any questions or notes to our speech. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. That's that's really complicated as well. Uh, it's mostly based on we have a, we made when we started the project a big list of themes we thought were um, essential to cover Europe. You should cover these themes. But for instance, of course, we didn't cover uh, a war that there would be a war in Europe or a pandemic in Europe. You know, so there the, the list can be refreshed uh, re refreshed every um, every year, um, and. With this list in our mind, we try to look for regions where um, we can find this, this theme, where we think it, it, it fits in our definition of the European heartland. So you have this American saying of the heartland, you know, the, 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 the sort of center of uh, industry, of uh, outside of the political specter, uh, center, um, a sort of heartland of the United States, which is really much covered in this uh, American road trips. So we try to copy that concept to, uh, to Europe. So we try to visit the European heartland. So we, we decided never to visit capital cities, for instance, or uh, very touristic uh, regions, though unfortunately we, we just visited quite a touristic region, but with another uh, purpose. Um, um, so we, we, we have this kind of selection criteria we make, and then we try to look for partners as well. So there's a huge list, list of criteria and themes and regions, and then uh, we see where we can go to and where we can work, where we can uh, have a partner to work with as well. So it's, um, it's, it, that's our way of working, and uh, we, we, we still don't know where we're going next year, for instance. There is not a fixed list no. yet. 
but there are themes to follow. And for example, the black country is about mining industry, um, but you can make a ser series about the black country that is quite similar in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Germany, in England, Poland, yeah. Poland, Greece. Etc. So there are many regions which fit this black country. So that's why we don't mention country names because then our, our project, the black country, could be anywhere actually. And it looks the same everywhere because everyone, everywhere is the same post-industrial wasteland, so to say, uh, wherever you go to these old industrial centers. And our most recent chapter, which is indeed in a beautiful area, but the local people try to prevent that it becomes a tourist uh, region, um, which it is already. Um, the main theme over there is, first of all, a kind of uh, desire or longing towards independence, which is also very fitting towards many regions in Europe. Uh, and secondly, uh, they um, suffer from increasing housing prices, which is a totally European thing, of course, but they suffer from increasing housing prices because rich people are buying up all this land as kind of second houses, which is also fitting to the whole coastline in Europe, all beautiful places in Europe now. So if we choose a place, we can almost, almost always find a theme in it that is kind of common theme for Europe. And then for now, we decided to choose places where we can work together with a uh, cultural organization who's hosting us and also helping us finding a space for exhibitions, uh, getting connections, those kind of things. But we know that it works maybe in, it's quite difficult actually, but in France, in the Netherlands it works, in England it worked a little bit, in Lithuania it worked. But if you want to go to Moldova, it's questionable whether you can find a cultural organization hosting you. Maybe it's there, maybe not, but it becomes more difficult towards the next stages in the project and we should, should be more self-sufficient towards the end, I think, which makes it even more challenging. That's why we need even more support. I think, I think in every region we, we constantly repeat all the, the topics because you focus on one topic, but then you always go to food industry, for instance, or always touch upon, uh, for instance, housing crisis, you know, because it's everywhere. So you, you reach many topics in one region, but you focus for the, for, the, for, the, for the publication or the exhibition on really one big topic, one overlaying topic. And because we change the regions into thematical regions and we never mention the name of the region itself, for example, our next chapter, Our Ancestral Home, uh, is Pay Basque, f friends uh, Basque country. Um, but what we always do, and more and more in these presentations, is that we squeeze in portraits from the previous regions without telling people that they come from the previous region. And uh, we do that because that's actually really uh, an, a, a strong way of questioning prejudice. They expect it to be someone from their own region, but suddenly it appears that it's someone from a region where they have all kind of prejudice about. And uh, in that way, we also try to play with prejudice within the region, but also outside regions. Don't know if it's clear what I mean, but we are starting to secretly mingle up different portraits from different regions into, and that's going to be more and more uh, once we have more work, of course. Yeah. So in that sense, we're not a journalistic project because we're It's very different, um, many positive reactions, but uh, the, the thing nowadays in 2022 is that uh, people are more and more used to see the most beautiful picture of themselves or their region or their surroundings due to social media and the way we use photography. So it's not acceptable anymore to actually photograph the thing as they are instead of uh, making them super beautiful with the filters. So of course, some people say that it's an, uh, it's a, it's a, I don't know, a little bit a, a pale view on their region or it's, uh, or they don't see their region like we do, but that's all perfectly fine. Uh, as I said already, some are criticizing because of some details that are according to them not 
Completely. He was his marine officer in Den Helder, uh, who was really mad on us that we showed the brothel, and there was a, uh, uh, a small text underneath that said that the brothel is ma ma mainly fisted uh, uh, by uh, marine officers and, and personnel. And this old officer, this uh, pensioned officer, was really mad about it because, according to him, it never happens. So you have that, yeah. that kind of discussions. Uh. But that's fantastic uh, material to include in the next uh, stage of the chapter of the Europeans as well. Yeah. But this is, this is more like... A, but uh, the region presentations themselves are, are fantastic food for uh, discussions, conversations with all kind of people. Like I also mentioned, the discussion regarding Kamal or refugees in general. I mean, we work in the heartland, as we call it ourselves. Uh, we can't deny that there is a lot of populist voting over there as well uh, in, in many of these regions. So our audience for these exhibitions is a different audience than is here in the Bali or in an uh, exhibition space. And that's also why we prefer to show our work in um, those places, but also on the streets, instead of going into museums where we only find like-minded people and people who say, like, it's fantastic what you're doing and it looks great, uh, like they are saying it to all artists and all people. So that, that, that doesn't make a difference, in my opinion. And that's why we are really looking for getting the confrontation or getting the conversation uh, in the regions themselves. And it works. It, that's really fun. I mean, they're not beating us up, but you have good conversations over there. Uh, we. I hope we become more open-minded and they also, I hope the whole world becomes more open-minded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good uh, ambition. Yeah. Yeah. Any anyone else? In terms of identity, did you find like because when I see the pictures, I I see a lot of differences, even though you deal with the same topics. Did you already like I know that you're in the beginning, but still find like this European identity that you're like does it exist? A European identity. Yeah, yeah, like what I said in my in my in my story about uh, the war monuments, I think it's really based on defining the other and yourself. So it's really I think Europeans are really much into borders, old conflicts, and uh, <laughs> to, to 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 see how you as a as a city or a region are different from the other uh, uh, region. I think that's that's that, that's also this uh, strong connection with people's histories is something really European, I guess. Yeah. yeah, but that's also something we try to fight, of course, with this project. I mean, uh, the, the whole idea that that's all over Europe and maybe all over the world, and that's even in very small communities, everybody believes that they are unique. And I will speak for myself, but I, d I completely don't believe that people are unique. Everybody wants to be unique. That's a different thing. But you, your copy is somewhere in Europe, in a different town. My copy is also walking around over there. And the copy of the people we photograph are also walking around next door or three country countries further, where they also believe that they are unique. And the thing, actually, with the Europeans is that we try to make people understand that the identity that they believe is unique is a shared identity. We are all actually quite much the same in Europe. That's what I believe. And of course, there are differences between you and me, and between you and me, et cetera, et cetera. But we ourselves are not so different from people in the, in the next country or next country. That's why we also mingle up people from Lithuania in a, in a story about that we make actually in, in, in uh, the Netherlands, and no one notice. And that's the whole idea. And then we're going to tell them, did you notice that, they, oh, no, don't know. No. But the prejudice towards East, Eastern Europe are big. If you say you are making a story about Lithuania, oh, former Soviet, socialist, communist, that's what people immediately think and, and believe. So uh, I don't believe that there are such big differences, and that's maybe the European identity for me, that the differences are not that big. But I can't really describe the European identity. That's our search the coming decade. Yeah. Uh, we brought a few copies of our most recent chapter. If you're interested, have a look. Um, and please have a look on our website. And last but not least, um, because we also feel a kind of uh, hopeless and helpless and whatever, towards the war in Ukraine, like everybody, I guess. Um, we had a stack of books 
an atlas of war and tourism in the Caucasus that you saw in the presentation. And we sell them and the full amount of 4750 goes to Red Cross Ukraine immediately. There is no deduction of anything. 4750 goes to Ukraine. If you already own the book, buy it for your neighbor or whatsoever. And uh, it was running so fast that we first donated uh, 3,900 euro already. Then we ran out of book. We told Aperture, the publisher in New York, they immediately said, we're donating another stack of 100 books or something, 100 something, and they're now on a boat to the Netherlands. That's why we have new stack and there are 25, 30 books left and we want to sell them all to, to, to contribute as much as we can to. So if you have some money left or you think someone wants to have a book about Russia, buy it. The money goes to Red Cross UK. Okay. That's it for now. We are here for a beer or whatever. Thank you.